Hi everyone, Tracy DW here. It has been 42 years since Zimbabwe achieved independence. In 1979, the Lancaster House Agreement was signed between the British government and Zimbabwe's first democratically elected government, led by Prime Minister Robert Mugabe. In that document lay the foundations for Zimbabwe to become a fully-fledged sovereign state. Celebrations took place on the 18th of April in 1980 and celebrations have taken place on that same day every year thereafter. In 1987, Mugabe was elected president. It has now been four and a half years since a military coup led by Vice President Emerson Manangagawa ousted Mugabe from power in November 2017. The coup was to end the despotic and dictatorial rule of Mugabe under which Zimbabwe's plight became so dire that in 2009 it adopted the US dollar. During the last two decades, it has found itself within the top 10 African nations to receive some of the largest investment loans from China. In 2013, an election dispute between Mugabe and then opposition leader Morgan Svangarai swiftly brought to an end a unity government. Mugabe's rule oversaw a 40-year period in which Zimbabwe had become a shadow of its former self. Once praised as the breadbasket of Africa, it was now a country with record inflation, a weak currency, food shortages and high unemployment, where half the population were engaged in low-waged, incidental work with limited opportunity for an entrepreneurship or prospects of progression within a clear career structure. It is fair to say that the Covid pandemic has also taken its toll over the past two years. This is the Zimbabwe that Manangagua inherited in 2017 and his desire for Zimbabwe to engage with the international community saw him repeal repressive laws relating to access to information and privacy protection in order to promote greater freedom of press. However, much of Zimbabwe's population and Manangagawa's critics have asked what reforms has he actually achieved and why has the situation in Zimbabwe not improved. Zimbabwe's plight could be perceived as representational of the situation that many former colonies across Africa find themselves in. Making leaps and bounds in technology but their infrastructure is still underdeveloped. We can look back over the past decade since Ghana's independence in 1957 and be rightly frustrated and angered about the lack of infrastructure that, until recently, still affected much of the African continent. However, in order to understand Zimbabwe's present situation, we need to also look back, not at how colonialism ended, but how its journey as an independent nation began. In 1979, the indigenous population of Zimbabwe consisted of two tribes who were politically and militarily represented by two entities. Zanla, the military arm of Zanu, represented the Shona people, and Zipra, the military arm of Zapu, represented the Nadibli people. Although both tribes had a collective desire for independence away from British colonial power, their internal division was further fuelled with funding from opposing nations of the Soviet Union, funding Zipra, and China, funding Zanla. So this transition into independence played out within a context that saw a fusion 
between politics and warfare that wasn't necessarily promoting pro-democracy. This was not unique to Zimbabwe and was characteristic of what was going on across the African continent at that time. British PM Harold Macmillan's Wind of Change speech, given in Ghana and South Africa in 1960, was timely and prophetic about these changes in ideology across the colonies, and I encourage you to read this speech. The Lancaster Agreement saw a transition of power, but with little clarity in relation to how Britain would assist in defining roles and the capacity of those roles within the new Zimbabwean government. This, together with a failed land distribution programme, resulted in the expulsion of many white farmers and displacement of Zimbabwean farm workers. Much of the land was reallocated to Mugabe's officials whose limited knowledge of farming saw a decline in agricultural food production and an increase in city slums as people migrated from rural areas and across Zimbabwe's border into neighbouring countries. Finally, Mugabe had held a monopoly on governing the country through the ZANU-PF party since 1980 and had been continually accused of corruption through rigging elections and violating the process of democracy to enable free and fair elections. The ZANU-PF monopoly has also extended into the economy where a cartel structure predominantly exists so that talent and competency are often compromised to ensure that the money and decision making remains within the hands of an elite group of people. Now, cartels are not unique to Zimbabwe and they exist globally and in economies throughout the world. A well-known cartel is OPEC the organisation of the petroleum exporting countries, which has around 80% of the world's oil reserves. However, in a country like Zimbabwe, with very little infrastructure to support real economic growth, these cartels, lack of clarity in government roles, the failures of land redistribution and the inability to separate politics and economics away from military interests, have all become endemic to the country's problems. So how can Manangagua unpick this tangled web? To the ordinary citizen of Zimbabwe, change is probably not happening quickly enough, but to others, change is not always viewed as acting within their interests and altruism is an ideal that is never fully realised. It all goes back to the fundamentals of leadership, the ability to clarify and define what your objectives are and how they will be achieved, convince people to follow your lead and then manage their expectations of you. When leadership happens through different political parties taking turns in office, it can bring a balance of perspective and encourages freedom of thought and ideas that develop a flexible approach to working through collective issues. Leading in a time of war is not the same as leading to achieve prosperity. And while certain skills are necessary, others are not necessarily transferable. With elections not too far away, is this an excellent opportunity for reform? One type of cartel that could promote positive reform is a coalition or cooperative arrangement between its political parties to promote mutual interests. Firstly, to clarify and agree on the country's own constitution and secondly, this is in relation to the first, to enable in the longer term a peaceful succession in transferal of power from one government to the next. Peaceful succession or transferal of power does not necessarily make society perfect, but it does enable progress to be made. And within this progress, a society can begin to solve its own problems. Can Zimbabwe achieve the progress that it 
desperately needs to make to solve its own problems? If you liked this podcast, then stay on this listening platform and listen to my other episodes related to this one, such as Zanu and Zapu, Contrasts and Similarities, A Call to Action, Macmillan's Wind of Change speech and Wind of Change Expanded, which I also allude to in this episode. And finally, don't forget what I call the heart and soul of the Stories to be Told movement, my stories or poetic narratives, Caribbean Wind, Caribbean Rush, Nights at the Round Table, the Berlin Conference 1884 and Gone with the Wind, Macmillan's Speech for Change. These are all available on the website in both ebook, Kindle and paperback formats. Well, it's official. I've sent out my first email to all of you who have signed up for free samples of my current published titles and one of you will be declared my winner for April and receive a copy of Aspiring Authors magazine for Black History 2022. If you're on the list, then watch out for a direct email from me from info at stories to be told dot com. So remember, I've decided to run this promotion beyond the month of March and continue to give away a free copy each month right up to UK Black History Month in October to a lucky winner on my email list. So visit the website stories to be told dot com and register for your free samples to enter the draw. Feel free to like, follow and share us on social media when you visit the website. Just click on to whichever social media link you'd like to follow us on. And as always, it's a pleasure and a privilege to share my learning journey with you in this podcast series. And I encourage you to either begin or continue your own. History is a matter of fact or perspective. To all the people of Zimbabwe, happy Independence Day. I'm Tracy DW and this is a Stories To Be Told podcast. Stay safe, stay well, stay blessed. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you on the next page. <laughs>